Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar brought to you by Mix It Up from Bayer Crop Science. My name is Michelle Allison, and I'm the group publisher of agriculture here at Annex Business Media, representing Top Crop Manager magazine today. Today is the second of three installments of this year's resistance management webinar series. And today I'm joined by Peter Sikama, professor in weed management of field crops at University of Guelph, Bridgetown. Today during our session, Peter will share insights about the expansion of water hemp through the countryside and present methods to manage this tough pest. A big thanks to Mix It Up by Bayer Crop Science for sponsoring our session today. From seed to harvest, Bayer is focused on delivering top performing solutions to address some of your toughest farm challenges. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all attendees and registrants approximately 24 hours after the live broadcast. This session is scheduled to run for approximately 45 minutes and following Peter's presentation, we'll open the floor for questions. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to type them into the questions tab found on the GoToWebinar panel on your computer screen. This webinar has been approved for one CCA CEU credit in integrated pest management. Further instruction will follow the presentation if you did not include your CCA number on the registration form. So without further ado, uh, Peter, I'll let you take it away from here. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. In my presentation this afternoon, I would like to share with you the latest information that we have on multiple herbicide resistant water hemp in Ontario. This happens to be one of our uh, research sites on Walpole Island. And to the left of the uh, tree line in the middle of the picture is, are the soybean experiments. And then the uh, corn experiments are on the right hand side. Where you see the plots that are lime green in color, those would be herbicide treatments that provided poor control of water hemp and soybean. And adjacent to it, you can see the dark green soybean, and that, those would be herbicide treatments that provided good control of water hemp. In terms of water hemp's biology, in terms of its life cycle, it is a summer annual weed similar to red root pigweed. But what differentiates water hemp from red root pigweed is that water hemp is a dioecious species. That simply means that you have separate male and female plants. And generally, there's about a one to one ratio of male to female plants. However, in stressed environments, there may be more female plants. But from the point of view of herbicide resistance, the fact that it's a dioecious species means that there's huge genetic variability within water hemp, and there may be genes that confer resistance to different herbicide modes of action. In terms of water hemp dormancy, it is established genetically. However, it is influenced by environment, and the variable dormancy enables water hemp to emerge in multiple cohorts throughout the growing season. And that simply means that water hemp emerges over an extended period of time and that complicates weed management. In terms of its germination and emergence, it's influenced by temperature. And typically water hemp seed has to go through a cold stratification period. That simply means in Ontario, the water hemp seeds falls to the ground one year, it goes through the harsh winter environment, and then it can germinate and grow the following summer. Germination and emergence is also influenced by light as well as moisture. However, the environmental requirements to initiate germination are not very strict. And therefore, just like I spoke about with dormancy, the emergence of water hemp occurs throughout the growing season, and you can have multiple flushes of water hemp beginning in May and continuing right through into the fall. In terms of its flowering, the pollen is spread by wind. Typically, the pollen moves less than 25 meters. However, pollen can remain viable up to 800 meters, 
So you could have the movement of water hemp genes from field to field within a small area. And the uh, pollen can remain viable for up to five days after release from the anther. And after pollination, it only takes nine to 14 days for water hemp to form viable uh, weeds, seeds. The time to flowering is influenced by the emergence date. So plants that emerge in May may take 90 days to go from emergence till it goes through the vegetative stage and begins reproductive growth. In contrast to that, if water hemp emerges in August or September, it could take less than 30 days from the time of emergence till it goes into its reproductive stage. And the flowering pattern is referred to as a pulsed flowering pattern. And there can be up to 10 flowering pulses during the growing season. And the flowering pulses are dictated by our environmental conditions. And in biology, we refer to that as bet hedging. So in terms of water hemp, if it flowers at 10 different times during a growing season, you can almost be assured that in some of those uh, flowering periods, the weather conditions are gonna be right for successful pollination and viable seed to form so that it has progeny next summer. In terms of water hemp seeds in an uncompetitive environment, one female plant can produce up to 4.8 million seeds per plant in a study conducted by Bob Hartzler at Iowa State University. However, if a water hemp plant emerges at the same time as soybean, the number of seeds produced per plant are reduced by about 95% to 300,000 seeds per plant. And if water hemp emerges 50 days after soybean planting, the number of seeds per plant is reduced to only 3,000 seeds per plant or greater than a 99% reduction in the number of seeds per plant. The seeds have, a relative, have relatively short seed longevity in the soil. There are some peer-reviewed manuscripts that show that water hemp can remain viable in the soil for up to two decades. But in most studies, water hemp seed either germinates or degrades in less than five years. Water hemp is a very competitive uh, weed. It can grow up to 2.5 centimeters per day, or you could say it grows more than one inch per day, and it can reach heights of greater than three meters. This happens to be one of my previous graduate students. This is Mike Shriver. The picture was taken by one of his fellow graduate students, Brittany Hedges. Mike's about my height, so I think he's about 1.8 meters in height. And you can see that this water hemp plant on a farm in Essex County is easily three meters in height. So this is a very aggressive weed. Based on studies in Ontario, the average yield loss in corn was 19%. And in our most competitive environments, yield loss in corn can be up to 99%. And in soybean, the average yield loss was 43%. And in our most competitive environments, the yield loss was 93%. <clears throat> So in terms of herbicide resistance in water hemp, first of all, talking about glyphosate resistance. In 2014, poor control of water hemp was reported in a field in Lambton County. Seed was collected, the plants were grown in the greenhouse, sprayed with glyphosate. And this is what Mike Shriver found. So in seed that he collected from a field that he numbered 25 and 27, they was sprayed with glyphosate, that's what the G stands for. And you can see that the water hemp was susceptible to glyphosate and it was controlled in the greenhouse. In contrast to that, uh, water hemp seed collected in field number 21 and field number 46 was sprayed with the same rate of glyphosate in the greenhouse and you can see that they did not die. And Mike confirmed that we have glyphosate resistant water hemp in Ontario. However, not only is water hemp resistant to the group nine herbicide glyphosate, in many fields, it's also resistant to the group two herbicides. And if you have a tryptophan 
to leucine, amino acid substitution at position 574 of the ALS enzyme, that amino acid substitution confers resistance to pursuit and imidazolinone herbicide. It confers resistance to classic asulfonylurea herbicide, and it confers resistance to first rate a triazolopyrimidine herbicide. In addition to group two and group nine resistance, there's also group five resistance in Ontario. So in this research conducted by Mike Shriver in field number 22, who was sprayed with glyphosate, and this biotype is resistant to glyphosate. It's resistant to the imazethapyr or pursuit, and it's also resistant to A stands for atrazine. So we know that in this field, there's water hemp that's resistant to the group two, five, and nine herbicides. But within the group five herbicides, there's two different mechanisms of resistance that confer resistance to the group five herbicides. And the first mechanism of resistance is enhanced metabolism. And it's by a glutathione S transferase enzyme or a GST enzyme. And this is the specific enzyme. There's elevated levels of this enzyme that break down the herbicide. So if you have elevated levels of this GST enzyme, it confers a high level of resistance to atrazine, but metribuzin, another group five herbicide, is still effective. And the resistance is both paternally and maternally inherited, and the resistance is passed on by both pollen as well as by seed. So this happens to be a farm. <clears throat> in Essex County, and here you can see uh, atrazine was applied, and this water hemp biotype has elevated levels of the GST enzyme that I just referred to in the previous slide. The GST enzyme binds to the chlorine at the number one position of the atrazine molecule. It breaks down the atrazine inside this weed and the atrazine is not no longer poisonous and you have a resistant biotype. Really interesting, in experiments conducted in soybean on the exact same farm, you apply metribuzin, another group five herbicide, and notice you get near perfect control. And the reason is, is metribuzin does not have a chlorine at the number one position. It has an oxygen at the number one position. So there isn't a binding site for glutathione S transferase. The herbicide, the herbicide is not broken down in those water hemp plants and the herbicide still provides weed control. But more recently, about three years ago, we realized that there's a second mechanism of uh, resistance that converts resistance to the group five herbicides in Ontario. And that happens to be an altered target site. And it's a serine to glycine amino acid substitution on the PSBA gene. And in contrast to enhanced metabolism, if you have this on your farm, it confers resistance to the symmetrical triazines like atrazine and the asymmetrical triazines like Sencor. And in contrast to enhanced metabolism, this resistance is only maternally inherited. It's not passed on by the pollen. It is only passed on but through the seed. So just to show you the difference in the greenhouse, if the mechanism of resistance on your farm is enhanced metabolism, it will confer resistance to atrazine. So here you can see where atrazine was applied. The water hemp is resistant to that herbicide, but it's sensitive to metribuzin. In contrast to that, if you have the altered target site, notice where atrazine was applied or metribuzin, now the water hemp is still alive. And this mechanism of resistance confers resistance to both the symmetrical triazines like atrazine and the asymmetrical triazines like metribuzin. So just to show you how different it is in the field depending on your mechanism of resistance, 
So here, the black bar graph is a field that has enhanced metabolism. And this is the rate of metribuzin that was applied. So 560 grams is about the mid rate registered in Ontario. And you can see that if you have enhanced metabolism, metribuzin provides 94% control. In contrast to that, if you have the altered target site, the exact same rate of metribuzin in the field, and you can see that the control is 3%. So just to show you how dramatically different the response is in the field, this is a field where you have the enhanced metabolism that confers resistance to the group five herbicides. Metribuzin was applied at 560 grams per hectare and pretty nice control. In contrast to that, this is the field that has the altered target site. It was near Petrolia in Lambton County. Metribuzin was applied at the exact same rate and there was no control at all. That is the implication of mechanism of resistance on performance of herbicides in the field. But not only do we have group two, five, and nine resistant water hemp in Ontario, in this research that was conducted by Brittany Hedges, well, she was a graduate student in my program, she applied laser, reflex, cobra, aim, aragon, and blackhawk, and on a susceptible biotype, she had perfect control uh, with those herbicides. Notice in seed collected from field to, uh, 1607, it was uh, sprayed with the exact same herbicides as listed above, and the uh, mechanism of uh, resistance confers resistance to all six of those herbicides. So blazer, reflex, and cobra are diphenyl ether herbicides. AIM is an aerotriazinone. Aragon is a pyrimidine dione, and Blackhawk is a phenylpyrazole. And if you have this mechanism of resistance, it will confer resistance to all of those herbicides applied post emergence. So, this happens to be a field in Middlesex County. And so, I know one of the hosts online is Andrew Chisholm from uh, Bayer. So, this won't be very far from where he grew up. Anyways, this was seed that we collected in 2019, the 20th field that year. And uh, it was uh, sprayed with the group two herbicide, imazethapir, and it was resistant to it. It was uh, resistant to the group five herbicides, atrazine and metribuzin. It's resistant to the group nine herbicide, glyphosate, and the group 14 herbicide, lactofen. So for this farmer in Middlesex County, this will dramatically reduce the number of herbicide options he has available for controlling this water hemp biotype. And it's especially important in, in a soybean. So all that we knew in 2014 was that there was one field in the southwest corner of Lambton County with uh, glyphosate resistant water hemp. And now six years later, in 2020, their glyph um, multiple herbicide resistant water hemp is from Essex County in the Southwest to Leeds and Granville, uh, uh, Granville County in Eastern Ontario. So this water hemp biotype now appears across a distance of 700 kilometers in only six growing seasons. So it's found in 14 counties in Ontario. In eight of those 14 counties, so in more than 50% of the counties in Ontario, it's resistant to the group two, five, nine, and 14 herbicides. In six of the, uh, sorry, in five of the counties, there's three-way resistance. And in Brant County, there's two-way resistance and it's resistant to the group two and nine herbicides. So that raises the question, how is this water hemp biotype moving across the, uh, uh, the province of Ontario so rapidly? So this happens to be a John Deere dealership in Essex County. And much to my surprise, the place where water hemp uh, showed up in the neighboring farmer's field is adjacent to the repair shop. So combines are brought to this uh, repair shop to be repaired 
or possibly they're traded in and they're refurbished. Anyways, they wash the combines. There's a cement pad here. The water flows from the repair shop into the neighboring farmer's field. And that's where water hemp appeared in this field. This happens to be a field in Lambton County. And I took this picture myself. And uh, I think you can be almost positive that this water hemp was moved into the field either with a contaminated combine or tillage equipment. And that raises the question, where was that combine or tillage equipment in the previous field where the water hemp came from? This happens to be a field in Huron County. And there's a semicircle right around the field entrance point where there's water hemp in this field. And possibly water hemp was introduced into the field on tillage equipment. This happens to be a field in Haldeman County. In the background, you can see the blue there, that's the Grand River. I remember personally talking to the farmer and the only place he had water hemp on his farm is where the Grand River overflowed its banks. And the reason why water hemp is called water hemp is uh, the seeds flowed in water and the seeds were deposited into his field. And once again, that raises the question, there must be farmers upstream from this location that have water hemp on the farm, and then it's just flowing downstream with the water in the river. This happens to be a picture in uh, Lambton County. And uh, here we think that water hemp moved in from the field edges. And the reason why I say that in some really interesting work by Julia Kreiner, a PhD student at the University of Toronto, the water hemp in Lambton County is almost identical genetically to the water hemp that's been in Ontario for more than a century. But for the first, let's say 90 years, it was really confined along open water courses in the province. And then something changed and it's now adapted to our corn and soybean production systems. And the last one is migratory birds. This is a picture that I took in uh, Essex County and really interesting. Once again, it was researched by Julia Kreiner at the University of Toronto. The water hemp in Essex County is almost genetically identical to the water hemp in the state of Missouri. And so that raises the question, how did water hemp from Missouri end up in Ontario. And it could have moved with uh, tillage equipment, it could have moved in uh, animal feed, and there was a really interesting study on the movement of weed seeds in the digestive tract of migratory birds. And in that uh, research, a migratory bird could ingest seed and fly 3,000 kilometers before it dropped it in some other area. So the question is, is why is water hemp an increasing problem in the province of Ontario in 2021? I've been in this job for more than 25 years. And if I remember correctly, I did not do one grower presentation on water hemp till 2015. And now I'm asked frequently to speak about this weed. And so the, why is this uh, weed an increasing problem? There is a trend to reduce strip and no-till crop production in Ontario, and that favors small seeded broadleaf weeds like water hemp. In addition to that, uh, water hemp is a dioecia species with wide genetic diversity. Not only does that genetic diversity allow for the possibility of evolution to various herbicide modes of action, that diversity also allows it to adapt to our current production systems. It's an increasing problem because of the evolution of multiple herbicide resistance. As I showed you, we have four-way resistance in Ontario. Some farmers in the United States have seven-way resistance. And in Ontario, there's group two, five, nine, and 14 uh, resistant water hemp. And it's a competitive plant it has a rapid growth rate, high fecundity or high seed production, prolonged emergence, and relatively short dormancy, which means the seed bank turns over quickly, and you can go from a susceptible seed bank to a resistant seed bank 
in quite a rapid time frame. So I would mentioned about the emergence pattern of water hemp in Ontario. This happens to be researched by Mike Schreiber when he was a graduate student in my program. And in the seven days prior to June 1, about 400 water hemp plants came up per square meter. This is a logarithmic scale. Make sure you notice that. So this is 10 plants per square meter, 100 and 1,000. And so in the seven days before June 1, about 400 plants came up. In the seven days before June 14, about 500. What's really amazing and what should uh, cause all farmers to take note of this plant, in the seven days prior to August 22, uh, 100 water hemp plants came up per square meter. And in Mike's research, this plant was still emerging on October 25. So this plant begins emerging after the burn down herbicide in the spring or the last cultivation, and it continues to emerge throughout the entire growing season. So because of its emergence pattern, what are the implications for weed management? So uh, you must develop uh, full season weed control programs. Uh, you should start with a soil applied residual herbicide in corn, that could be Acuron, Fierce and Soybean, and then plan to follow it with an effective uh, post-emergence herbicide. And a possible program in corn could be Integrity, followed by Shield X plus Atrazine, or in Soybean, it could be Authority Supreme, followed by Reflex. In terms of uh, yield loss, in our st studies in Ontario, the yield loss in corn is an average of 19% but it can be up to 99%. And soybean, the average yield loss was 43%, and it could be as high as 93%. So this, uh, these are two pictures that I took last summer in a farmer's field in Ontario. We had never done research on this farmer's field before. And the average yield, corn yield in Ontario is 164 bushels per acre in 2013 to 2017. The average selling price was $4.86 a bushel. So corn is worth $794 per acre. In our most competitive environment, we had a 99% yield loss. So if Ontario farmers didn't implement any weed management tactics to control this weed biotype, there's a potential loss of $786 per acre. So uh, we uh, looked at a number of pre-emergence herbicides for water hemp control in corn. And you'll note that Broad Strike, Dicamba, Atrazine, Dual, Frontier, On Guard, Zidua, and Marksman provided 79% control or less. But there were some herbicides that were quite effective. Acuron Flexi, Lumax, Prime Extra, Callisto plus Atrazine, and Converge plus Atrazine provided 82 to 89% control. Integrity provided 91% control. And the most effective herbicide in our trials was Acuron at 95% control. So this is one of the experiments. Here you can see the water hemp pressure where no herbicide was applied. And on average, in our experiments, Acuron provided 95% control. So this is the control with Acuron in 30 field trials that we did. As I mentioned earlier, on average, it provides 90%, 95% control. In 33% of our experiments, it provided 100% control. In 50% of the experiments, the control was between 90 and 90%. 9%. Then in 10% of the experiments, the control was between 80 and 89. And some of you may think, well, that's still okay. And in reality, that's not okay. In some of the fields in Ontario, we have up to 4,000 water hemp per square meter. If you get 80% control, that means that you still have 800 water hemp plants per square meter. And that simply is not acceptable. We need 95% control or greater with this weed. In 3% of our experiments, the control was in the 70s, and in 3%, it was in the 60s. 
So weed control with any herbicide is variable from year to year and field to field. And that's due to uh, you need rainfall for activation with a soil applied herbicide like Acuron. It's influenced by soil characteristics. If you have a heavy textured soil, high in organic matter with a high CEC, the herbicides bound to the soil and not available for weed control. And some herbicides efficacy is influenced by pH. The group five, the group 14 and the group 27 herbicides are more effective on high pH soils than low pH soils. It's going to be influenced by the weed resistance profile as I just described, by weed density, time of weed emergence, and finally the competitiveness of the crop. In terms of post-emergence options in corn, you will note that Permit, Peak, Atrazine, Vios, Distinct, Liberty, 2,4-D, and Destra provided anywhere from 27 to 78% control. So that's not acceptable. But just like I showed you with the pre-herbicides, we do have some good post options. Partner, Marksman, Armazon, Promexter, Dicamba, Enlist, and Halix provided between 80 and 89%. Then Callisto Converge Shield X with Atrazine or Acuron Flexi provided 91 to 92% control. And Acuron is our most effective post-emergence herbicide as well as uh, pre-emergence. And here's one of the experiments. Here you can see the control plot and the really good control with a herbicide like Callisto plus Atrazine. I really think that all Ontario farmers should plan on using a two-pass weed control program in both corn and soybean. And here I'm just giving you one example. Shieldex Converge and Acuron were applied pre-emergence. They provided 84 to 98% control. But when followed by Liberty post-emergence, you can see the control increase to 96 to 99%. So now I'll switch to water hemp control in soybean. So uh, just like I showed you in corn, the average yield for soybean in Ontario is 46 bushels per acre. The average selling price was $12.90 for a total value of $587. In our most competitive environment, the uh, yield loss was 93%. So if Ontario farmers did not implement weed management tactics to control this biotype, they could potentially lose $546 per acre. I went to publication 75 and I listed all of the herbicides that have a rating of greater than eight on either pigweeds or water hemp. And that's just because they're closely related species. And so you'll note that dual frontier prowl, Trefland, Zidua Authority, Broad Strike, First Rate Pursuit, Sen and Volterra apply to the soil and post-emergence applications of Blazer, Classic, Pinnacle Pursuit, Reflex, Roundup, Liberty, Dicamba, and 2,4-D are all rated either eight or nine for either pigweed or water hemp. So, Based on our provincial weed control guide, there are 20 different options in terms of managing pigweed or water hemp if you don't have any herbicide resistance on your farm. But these are the control values in our experiments on commercial farms in Ontario. And you will note that none of these, with the exception of Volterra, has a rating of greater than 80%. So based on our field research of the 20 herbicides that have a rating of eight or nine for the control of pigweed and water hemp, uh, 19 of them do not con control the resistant biotypes that we're working with. And the only one that's still effective is Volterra at 84% control. So uh, similar to what we did in corn, you'll see that by effective boundary, Volterra and Authority uh, Supreme provided 81 to 84% control. And then the two most effective herbicides were Triactor and Fierce at 90 and 92% control. So this is the results from just one experiment. 
here's the weedy check. Boundary provided 82% control, authority supreme 84, and fierce 92. However, just like I said in corn, I think that all Ontario growers should plan a two-pass weed control program for managing this weed. So in Roundup Ready or Identity Preserve Soybean, yeah, Boundary and Authority Supreme applied pre-emergence provided 71 and 81% control in this research completed by Mike Schreiber. However, when he followed it with a post application of either Blazer or Reflex, the control was 98 to 100% with a two pass program. Similarly, in Extend Soybean, in this research conducted by Brittany Hedges, Zidua Authority, Boundary, and Fierce provided 71 to 90% control. Roundup Extend by itself provided 79% control. And when used in a two-pass program, the control was 96 to 99%. And uh, just to show you the results in the field, here's Authority Supreme, not uh, acceptable control. And here's Authority Supreme followed by Roundup Extend applied post-emergence. And finally, in Enlist Soybean, in this uh, research completed by Mike Shriver, Boundary Authority Supreme and Fierce provided 83 to 95% control. Enlist Dual by itself provided 77% control. And, it, and in a two pass program, you can see that the control was 99%. So this happens to be an experiment on Walpole Island. Here's uh, where Roundup was applied. This is obviously glyphosate resistant water hemp. Notice the excellent control with boundary applied pre-emergence followed by enlist duo applied post-emergence. So the question is, is does weed management matter? I took these two pictures in two fields right beside each other in Lambton County. Here's the uh, weedy field and this is the adjacent field right beside it. Both of these fields have soybean in it. The point that I want to make is that we do have the tools to manage multiple herbicide resistant water hemp in Ontario. So I think in summary, uh, corn and soybean growers should be prepared to use a two pass weed control program to manage multiple herbicide resistant water hemp. Start with an effective soil applied herbicide in corn, that could be Acuron or Integrity. In soybean, it could be Fierce, Triactor, Authority, Supreme, Boundary, or Bifecta. And then be prepared to apply a post herbicide if needed. And in corn, Acuron, Shieldex, Converge, Callisto, Enlist, and Dicamba are good post emergence options. In Identity Preserved or Roundup Ready soybean, you could come back with Reflex Blazer or hurricane. In Enlist Soybean, you could come back with Enlist Duo. And in Extend Soybean, you could apply Ingenia or Extendamax or Tavium post emergence. Uh, this is just a quote from uh, Stephen Powell's. He says, cropping systems diversity is the foundation for uh, resistance management. And this is a quote from Pat Trannell at the University of Illinois. And in their research, he wrote, we found that grower management practices was the number one factor that influenced the selection for glyphosate resistant water hemp on individual farms. So the question is, is what should farmers do? And I think farmers need to proactively inter introduce more diversity into their crop and weed management programs. I think every farmer should try to implement a as diverse a crop rotation on his farm as possible. I fully appreciate it has to fit within their farm structure, the machinery they have, the potential markets they have for the various crops. But the more diversity you have on your farm, the reduced selection intensity you will have for herbicide resistant weeds. If you have a diverse crop rotation on the farm, it allows you to utilize multiple herbicide modes of action over time. You can use uh, tillage at strategic points in the rotation. 
possibly plant cover crops after winter wheat combining. Plant in narrow rows where possible. So instead of planting soybean in 30 inch rows, maybe you go to 20, 15 or seven inch rows and even possibly consider purchasing a combine with harvest uh, weed seed control that will grind the weed seeds and make them non-viable so that they can't come back next year. I would like to thank all of the people that uh, work with me at uh, Ridgetown campus. You'll notice that I've listed the names of 17 graduate students. So I've had 17 graduate students that have worked on glyphosate resistant weeds over the past 10 years. And if it wasn't for their hard work, I simply wouldn't have the data that I shared with you today. I do want to thank the research technicians, Chris Kramer, Lynette Brown, and Christy Schrobschreier for their hard work, the summer research assistants, the funding agencies, and I would like to acknowledge funding from Green Farmers of Ontario, as well as the herbicide manufacturers. I would like to uh, close with a couple of uh, quotes, and this is from Andrew Niss at the University of Wyoming. And he uh, wrote, at some point, we need to stop looking to herbicides as the solution to a problem created by herbicides. And I would just say that I think Andrew's right on. We need to introduce more diversity into our crop and weed management programs. And my final thought for you is, if you do not have glyphosate on your resistance on your farm yet, adopt integrated weed management now and use glyphosate judiciously at strategic points in your long-term rotation. So uh, thank you very much. And I'd be more than happy to address any questions at this time. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for the great presentation. And then before we start our question and answer period, I'd just like to say thanks again to Beta Crop Science for their sponsorship of today's webinar. So we will dive into our question and answer period. If you have any questions, feel free to um, add them into the box on your panel. Um, so Peter, in your research, your reported yield losses from glyphosate-resistant Canada fleabane interference in corn is 54% and soybean is 63%, while the yield loss from glyphosate-resistant water hemp interference in corn is only 19% and soybean is 43%. So why is the yield loss from water hemp so much lower than the Canada fleabane? Yeah, a really good question, uh, Michelle. And I think the uh, difference is, is simply the biology of the weeds. So Canada fleabane is a winter annual or summer annual weed. And in many situations, the Canada fleabane will be two to four inches in diameter or two to four inches tall by the time the corn or soybeans emerge. And it has a competitive advantage over the corn and soybean and therefore the uh, yield loss in corn and soybean is quite high. In contrast to that, water hemp is a, only a summer annual weed, it's not a winter annual, and therefore uh, the corn and soybean generally come up first. Water hemp tends to be a later emerging weed and the corn and soybean have a competitive advantage over the weed and therefore the wheat, uh, yield loss due to water hemp interference is lower than it is uh, with Canada flea bean. Thanks for the question. Perfect, great. Um, the next one we've got here is, what do you think is the most successful strategy to control multiple resistant water hemp in corn and soybeans? Yeah, and so uh, like I said in my presentation, I think that all farmers, when they're planning their weed control program, if they have multiple herbicide resistant water hemp on the farm, is uh, during, let's say, January, February, March, April, they should plan an effective two pass weed control program. And so, what I mean by that is you want to put down the most effective soil applied herbicide you can and then monitor the field. Sometimes in our research, that's all you'll need for the whole summer. However, in contrast to that, most of the time, those soil applied herbicides will break 
at some point during the growing season and always be prepared to come back with a post-emergence herbicide. So in uh, corn and soybean, I think the answer is the same. Start with a, an effective soil applied herbicide. Make sure you scout the field frequently and be prepared to put on a post-emergence herbicide if needed. Great, okay. Now we've got a few more here. Um, so why does the water hemp evolve resistance to herbicides so rapidly rel relative to other summer annual weeds uh, like velvet leaf? Yeah, I think it's once again, it's the uh, biology of the weed. As I mentioned in my presentation, water hemp is a dioecious species. That means you have separate male and female plants. And it, that means it's an obligate cross-pollinating species. And because of that, you have huge genetic diversity in water hemp, and there's the potential for crossing over mutations, whatever, that for uh, genes that confer resistance to various herbicide modes of action. And that's why water hemp tends to evolve resistance to multiple herbicide modes of action more quickly than many other weed species. Okay, great. Um, are there any proven um, integrated weed management systems available to recommend to growers for adoption? Wow, am I ever glad you asked that question. So uh, four years ago, we started a nine year integrated uh, weed uh, water hemp management project on two commercial farms in Ontario. So this research is not a, on the research station. This is on real farms. In, one farm is in Essex County and the other farm is in Lambton County. What we did before we started the research is we took soil cores to no, uh, document how many water hemp seeds were in the seed bank at the time that the experiments were started. And at the one location, there was 165 million water hemp seeds per acre in the field on a commercial farm in Ontario before we started our research. Anyways, what we did is we implemented 12 different uh, treatments. Anyway, we had continuous soybean, we had a corn soybean rotation, a corn uh, soybean wheat rotation, a corn soybean wheat rotation followed by uh, a cover crop. And in soybean, we plant them in either 30 inch rows or we planted them in 15 inch rows. We've just finished analyzing the soil cores after three years. And uh, this will be the first time I'm uh, releasing this data publicly. But anyways, in our most diverse crop rotation, corn, soybean, wheat, we had seven effective herbicide modes of action. We reduced the soybean row width from 30 to 15 inches. And after winter wheat combining, we put, planted a cover crop of oats plus uh, tillage radish. We were able to reduce the number of water hemp seeds in the seed bank by 90% over three years. So I think this research shows conclusively that there are weed management tactics that every farmer in Ontario could implement on his farm. They wouldn't have to change their equipment at all hardly. And uh, we're trying to use tactics that every farmer in Ontario can use. And so far we're showing that it's being uh, quite successful. Perfect, that's great. Um, we have a couple more questions, but with that, I would actually like to run a quick poll um, of the attendees. And so I'm going to launch that on your screen. And the question is, have you seen water hemp on your farm? So if, attendees, if you could just take a, a few seconds and answer that, um, that'll give us a quick picture of the audience. for a couple more seconds. <clears throat> right, so looks like about 5% are saying yes, they're seeing it right now. All right, hide those. And then I have a couple more questions for you, Peter. Sounds good. 
All right. Are soybean and corn growers able to assess their fields for the presence of herbicide resistant biotypes? Yes, and there's uh, two different ways that you can do that. And so there's a company in Guelph called Harvest Genomics, and you can send either leaf samples or seeds to Harvest Genomics, and they can do genomic tests and identify whether you have group 2, 5, 9, or 14 resistant water hemp on your farm. I do want to stress that the uh, genetic tests that are available in 2021 will only be able to identify certain mechanisms of resistance. And so even though you will get your results from Harvest Genomics, and I think they're really good, so I'm not saying anything bad about them, you still have to repeat that research in the greenhouse so that you can uh, identify mechanisms of resistance that there is not a genetic test for today. And say, for example, if you have water hemp that's resistant to the group five herbicides due to enhanced metabolism, there is no genetic test available in 2021 to identify it. So your results from harvest genomics would say that it's sensitive to the group five herbicides, when in reality, it may be resistant, but it's just a mechanism of resistance that they cannot uh, test for with the genetic tests we have in 2021. Perfect. Okay, so then I have one more question here, and your work, recent work might land on this a bit. What kind of work is being done on using the seeding rate or plant population as part of the strategy against this weed? Yeah, so uh, totally a really good question. I think anything you can do to encourage the crop to close the canopy more rapidly is going to be one component of an integrated weed management program. So if you uh, could uh, plant soybean in seven inch rows, possibly at a higher seeding rate, it's gonna close the canopy quicker and it will give the crop a competitive advantage over the weeds. And that will be one component of your integrated weed management program. Perfect, thanks. So um, with that, I think that's all of our questions. If there's any other questions, um, please reach out to us and we'll do our best to get an answer from Peter for you. Um, before we end today, a reminder that this webinar has been approved for one CCA CEU credit. If you did not submit your CCA certification number when registering, please email your first and last name and CCA number to webinars at annexbusinessmedia.com. And these instructions will also be found in our follow-up email, which will hold the recording of the webinar as well. Thanks again, Peter, for the great presentation. And thank you to all of the attendees for tuning in for today's webinar. And don't forget to visit topcropmanager.com webinars to view all of our previous and upcoming webinars. The next installment in this series will happen on May 4th with Rianne Tideman. So until then, um, hopefully you're staying warm. Maybe you're not in Manitoba with the snowstorm like I am, but um, I hope you have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you.